Let's see. And where is my partner in crime, Erica Smith? I hope she didn't get caught in traffic. Well, while we take a second and get going, um, let me clear off my desk and make sure that I've got my stuff together. Don't these days feel like goat rodeos sometimes? Let's see. Okay. Good morning, Amanda. Oh, that's a bumper sticker. I don't want to put a bumper sticker on my lapel. Let me get my sticker. I hope people got their little swag packages. Skank School was so awesome to mail those out for us. There we go. Put that on. Um, and let me make sure. Let me see if my share screen stuff is available. Um, Google Drive. Hey, Megan. Hi, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Uh I'm almost home. I'm driving, so I just have it on Zoom audio, I think. Okay. So, um, I mean, hopefully, yeah, I'm going to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> so question, is it okay if I start with showing everybody dyslexia is my superpower? Hey, Stu, let's show. Okay. It's awesome. Okay. Let me make sure. Oh, hold on. Stop. Stop, movie. Stop. You're not supposed to go yet. Okay. Let me go over to my Zoom. Okay. And how do I share my screen? Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's see where my Zoom is. Oh, there. Okay. Oh, hi, Erica. Let's see. Now I'm going to share my screen. There it is. Mm -hmm. And play this. Can everybody see it? Yes. Okay. I have a superpower. I have a superpower. I have a superpower. I think differently. I see the world differently. I'm Jared. I am a builder. I am a creator. Do not underestimate me. 
Do not sell me short. Do not tell me I can't. I just need you to help me learn to read. With evidence-based reading instruction. Evidence-based? Yes, evidence-based. Evidence-based, as in based on what science tells us about how most children learn to read. Help me learn to read. With the science of reading. And watch me grow my wings. Watch me fly! Watch me soar. Watch me change the world. Because I can do anything. With my brilliant really dyslexic mind. So thank you so much to Megan Swingle, who wrote that amazing poem, and Chris Holcomb edited it, edited all the different parts. Um, but that's just one of the things that is so amazing about our dyslexic children is they are so talented and creative. And um, one of the things that um, kind of stops them cold is the reading um, and how that's handled in schools. Um, I want to talk to Erica Smith, who is with I Define Me Transcending Learning Differences and the mother of author Kyler Smith. Um, Erica's on the screen right now. And um, Erica, let's start talking about early, uh, early identification, early intervention for students who have dyslexia and how our world kind of runs parallel to students who have other issues with how reading instruction is presented in the majority of American schools. So um, good morning, everyone. It's extremely important. I am an um, early childhood advocate. I typically advocate for zero through five, but then I've now become a learning difference disability advocate because of my children but how it runs parallel is in the basics of the phonetic awareness. Um, that's a huge piece of it, that if children are introduced to phonics from the beginning, then they will not need that remediation once they are in um, later years in schools. Um, so I'm a real big fan of the organ gillingham method. I personally thought I knew how to read with phonics, took the class and learned, wow, I've got to go back and figure out vowel, consonant, vowel, because once you learn to read that way, right, you can read any word, word whatsoever. And so one thing I tell a lot of people is I know people complain now, they don't realize that their school is implementing OG, but they'll say, my children's spelling words were completely different from the list that they were given to study. And it's like, well, we don't want them memorizing the words, because if they learn to sound those words out, they can learn any and everything. And so it's really important um, those early reading skills are critical and that they're being taught appropriately. I know a big push is always for parents to read to their children. And of course, that's extremely important. But in our situation is I read to my child constantly and he memorized all the books, right? And so I'm thinking he's reading, he's gonna be you know, on top of the world here. And um, he did not have phonetic awareness. And if I had known that early on, and if he had been taught explicitly early on, I would have been able to tell that he's memorizing these words. And he was actually identified fairly early compared to other people. But I just thought, well, he's brilliant and he knows everything. But it, it, what it was in the end is that his auditory is extremely high. And when you're reading, you're constantly reading, he's memorized all the books. But then when you started getting uh, six or seven and around seven, you're supposed to be reading chapter books, well, he can't memorize a chapter book, right? And so another huge piece of that, the huge component of that is self-esteem. My son has huge self-esteem. And um, I attribute that to us being able to catch it earlier rather than later. Um, him being in originally in a small environment, he was not in a large class, the teacher and I, did not know what was going on. She's like, he's rocking out science, but he's not reading over here. I'm like, oh no, he reads really well. But he had, um, we began his uh, preschool years in Spanish. So at first I was like, well, maybe it's the Spanish. Well, maybe it's the Spanish. And then just kind of began to do my own searches because he also was writing entire spelling tests backwards or he'd have all the letters, but they'd be out of sync. Well, now I know that's typical dyslexia, right? But at the time I didn't know. And so I began to Google and we got on that search of saying, 
okay, you have dyslexia, dyspraxia, and dysgraphia. Rarely does one person just have one, right? Which was something else I didn't know. So a big thing when I'm advocating for people to um, put their children in zero through five, um, because we know that children need that intervention by the first grade, right? And so we say that if the children are not, a lot of children that have reading difficulties by the first grade, I believe it's 75% of them um, go on to be struggling readers if they're not given that proper instruction. So it's just imperative that we just give the instruction from the beginning. We give the instruction across the board. I believe that a child that's typically on grade level with that explicit instruction goes up about two grade levels and that struggling learner um, or challenge learner, as I like to say, will be on grade level. And then what also goes along with that is the language lag. And so we have the language base issues, but then we have the language lag where you have not been um, exposed to preschool um, or you have not been in a language enriched home. But again, if you're given that explicit instruction, everybody would be will be on grade level or above um, once they get it, reach at school, third grade milestone test. Right. And I wanted to draw everybody's attention to where, did I, oh, here it is. Um, I wanted to draw everybody's attention to the Reading Lead Journal. This is the brand new issue that came out. And this article is one that we have posted on the Facebook page, but it is a an eye-opening um, discussion starter for administrators, principals, um, early learning people, um, the title of the article is called Dyslexia, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of diagnosis and treatment. And it's by Dr. Hugh Katz, who's at Florida State, and Tiffany Hogan, who is up in Boston. Um, and this paper was originally written in September of 2020 and published by a, med uh, a thing of a medical journal. And... Um, Part, part of the myth busting that goes on when we advocate as parents is that, first of all, that dyslexia is seen and the signs of dyslexia are evident in every student who has it very early in their childhood career, um, whether they're seen in preschool or whether you as a parent are noticing things about your child's development um, going on. One of the um, best referral pieces I use um, when I'm advocating is the Skank Schools Dyslexia Resource Trust uh, Red Flag Checklist. And if I'm on a board and someone's asking, well, what are the, red, what are the signs for dyslexia? Th this is my go-to. And um, so preschoolers should be able to produce rhyming words. They should be able to divide words into syllables, divide sentences into words, discriminate rhyming words, and divide words into phonemes. Um, they should also be able to delete roots, syllables, and phonemes, and substitute a phoneme to a new word. So in other words, say fun, what is that? Now say it again, but change the F to S, son. Um, and, and red flags, the more people know what the red flags are, um, the better we can position children to move towards the discussion about how we intervene. Um, that was one of the greatest frustrations that I experienced when my son was diagnosed nine years ago. I take a, a step back further, we knew in preschool that he was having problems and the, there, was a speech was language a speech oh there was a speech language pathologist who would, who would do a $25 screening on your child. So I took that failure of the screening to our local elementary school before my son hit, um, hit uh, kindergarten. And the, the speech language pathologist did an evaluation well, he didn't do well enough. He didn't, he didn't do poorly enough, in other words. But the red flags were all there. But that was not, that didn't ring any bells for anybody. And that, that is where the greatest frustration is because kids can have um, speech issues and, and speech pathologists themselves sometimes are not 
not catching it, or at least the speech pathologists in the school settings are not catching it. So this year for advocacy, um, our, our real push is to lean into the idea that screening and intervening early is our best bet for success across schools um, for all students. Um, I don't, I didn't publish this, but last Thursday at the State Board of Education meeting, um, the board approved the state rule related to uh, the screening that was the one component of SB 48 that required a state rule change regarding setting up a process by which schools needed to screen for dyslexia using the ST, SST, MTSS models. Um, there are some schools in the state that are in what I understand is an MTSS pilot, and it's a multi-tiered support system program that is supposed to be similar to, but more robust than SST. Um, so we shall see. Um, there's no telling. I, I, the handbook went out in at the end of 2019 and uh, another challenge is that I really don't believe that very many um, teachers have gotten their hands on the, the book. And, and the reason for that is that SB 48 was not fully funded um, when it came out of the gate. And the Department of Education did um, publish printed copies of it and got those copies, one copy per school to every school in the state. Well, I'm guessing it is collecting dust bunnies behind somebody's desk, um, as things do. Because if you're not making noise about it, it will become uh, inert, inertia will set in. And um, reading the dyslexia handbook, going to the state rule um, that's just came out just came into place. I believe that there is a 30 day um, commentary window. I have not had a chance to confirm with the uh, assistant for the State Board of Education whether or not there is an open time frame. Uh, but I do know that March 25th is the State Board of the next State Board of Education meeting where that change to the state rule will um, be codified. So, you know, there, there are all sorts of little bits and pieces of SB 48 that can be used to help our kids now, um, but the frustration lies in getting the word out to people, getting school boards on board, talking to school board members, talking to State Board of Education members, really making a push for the dyslexia handbook and the other elements of SB 48 to make their way to the intended people. Because if it's just sitting on the State Board of Education or State Department of Education's website, it's not doing anybody any good. Um, so that's one of the things that parent advocates can really do um, to make sure that their schools are uh, starting a conversation. <laughs> we can't change it with one conversation, but it takes, it takes a lot of effort and, and a lot of, there are a lot of challenges. So Erica, in your early, in your work with years and the early, early learning space, what are some of the things that you're hearing on the ground from practitioners and uh, early learning people who are um, hearing this message or is there pushback? Is it, oh, it's poverty? What, what, what's? I don't think there's, no, I think it's a lack of knowledge, right? So I don't think it's that it's, it's always going to be considered poverty, right? Because this is what we've always been taught, myself included. If you read to your children, if you put your children in preschool, if they're in, you know, my kids were in music together and Jimbery, they're going to automatically get it. Right. So I think that there's the huge shift now 
in the importance of zero through five education, because we know if you go to pre-K, you're more likely to then finish high school, to then go on to college or trade school and not be on public assistance. So we're looking at that whole picture. But I think that a huge piece that's left out of it um, that I always try to bring to the conversation is making sure that we, for example, um, you said rhyming. My son never rhymed, but I was taught even in my early childhood education studies in undergrad to kind of wait and see so that it was, you know, like, oh, some kids don't, they didn't tell me specifically about Kyler, but some kids don't rhyme. So when he's not rhyming, I have an older son who likes to rhyme and do puzzles. I'm like, oh, it's not his thing. It's not his thing. It's not his thing. But you can know early on. So that's one of the things, you know, we'll, we'll hand out puzzles. Our, our, the space that I work in more or less is just trying to get the bodies in the classroom trying to let parents know and understand it is important for your three-year-old to be in a classroom. Since in the state of Georgia, you don't have to go to school till first grade. Well, by first grade, you're already a ton behind. And then you take a milestone test at third grade. And then people say, all oh, these people are not, you know, on grade level. And then they start building prisons. And so we have to look at the, the front end of that. But with that piece, again, with the uh, learning differences and the um, learning disabilities piece, that's a piece, but then the component is the language lag. So you might not have that disability, but you still need to be taught in that same way explicitly. And right. you still need those same applications applied. And so I don't necessarily get pushback from that. I think that it's more of a lack of knowledge because we don't learn that. We don't learn that in undergrad. I I'm third generation in, in education. My grandmother and my grandfather were educators. Um, this is not something, we always talked about education in the home, but we the learning differences, learning disabilities were something that we never discussed. And it's so it's kind of like stopping the stigma because as you talk to family members or as I look at myself, I had comprehension issues, not dyslexia, but oh, I had comprehension issues. And oh, my mother told me to read the questions first. A lot of the strategies I see them using with both of my children now, I'm like, oh, well, I was taught that. Okay, well, this is kind of how I slipped through. And then um, my father always would say words wrong. And my mother would say, oh, the SLP didn't do a good job when he was young, but it was never taken seriously. You know, but so now that we look at that, and my father is a 40 year old educator and did 504s for an entire school district and all of those things, you know. But now when you look back and you're saying, okay, some of this is genetic, it's like, oh, this is where the puzzle pieces go. And so I think another piece is, is, is admitting to yourself, right? Oh, I had these struggles. Maybe perhaps my child is having these struggles, right? <laughs> and the world is so different now. And so when we were in school, in the 80s, it wasn't so much about a test. And so, and they were able to do a little more tactile things. And like for myself, I went to Montessori school. So it just, it, it wasn't a huge thing, but I don't necessarily get pushback. They are more interested in listening. Yesterday, Kyla read to about 80 third graders um, in DeKalb County because they were on virtual in virtual school. And you can hear the teachers just kind of silent or saying, wow, you know, listening to the, to his story and then listening to me speak about how I found out that he had a learning difference. Um, so it's not necessarily pushback. It just all goes back to awareness and things go hand in hand. There's a new bill now that they're trying to pass to keep kids in the school till they're 17. I don't understand that. Why would you keep someone in school in 17? It's one or two things. Either they're struggling and their self-esteem is now lowered and they don't want to go further or they have no funding in their helping their parents. And so it's the poverty piece of it. We need to focus on the early childhood piece of it. You know, that's the piece. And I let them know. I mean, from a legislative point, I let them know all the time. Like, I love you dearly, but I am in, you know, all social media, like, this is not a good bill. But I don't think that they think that way. Because I, if you don't experience it yourself or your child doesn't experience it, your automatic thought is, well, if we put this new bill out there, or um, if parents read a little more, then the world would just be this great place. You know, the same thing with organizations. It, it's great that we give books out and it's great that we go and we read, you know, doing the month of Dr. Seuss, but that's not going to get all the children where they need to be. It's great exposure for them. You know, it's wonderful that we have people um, willing to volunteers in schools, but it takes so much more. And I don't know that people truly understand that piece of it. My, now my pediatrician, for example, there's a lot of things. She's like, pass it to me so I can post it. Because there's a disconnect when they're asking you about how many wet diapers and how many you know, times do they go potty and 
all those type of things. We also need to be talking about, are they rhyming, right? Are they, in, and the, why it's necessary because you have the CDC milestone checklist, but why is that important? You know, like if my child is W city, why is that a problem? We just know you sit crisscross applesauce, but you sit crisscross applesauce for the midline, right? To strengthen the midline. And I think that that's the piece that's missing. You, they ask questions, you give the answers, you're on schedule, you know, with the pediatrician, but then it's not, well, if their eyes aren't going from left to right, it's gonna be hard for them to read. If their midline's off and they're swayed, dysgraphia might be a thing, it's gonna be hard to write. It's just kind of like, this is what we do, but why do we do it? And so I think that that bridge needs to be gapped. And as much as I can, I'm always like talking everyone, my pediatrician is like, okay, we've been in here an hour, but talking <laughs> everyone's head off about it because the more I started going to the IDA workshops and learning all these things, I'm saying, well, I saw this, but I didn't know of it to be a rep. We could have started occupational therapy at two or three, had I known, you know. Right. So I think people a lot of times are concerned. People want everyone to read, but they're concerned more of, of course, getting them in the classroom, because that's important. And then making sure they have books, making sure they have puzzles and Play-Doh, but the application piece, because a big piece with Play-Doh, what we know is that strengthens hand muscles, yeah. right? The, the Play-Doh mm -hmm. and the clay. So it's not simply playing with the Play-Doh. So it's almost to me like we need recipe cards and says, mm -hmm. this is why we're playing with the Play-Doh. And if your child's not playing with that Play-Doh, <laughs> Or if they're complaining that their hand hurts. My son used to say his hand hurts when he's writing. I had never heard of that. I would say, your hand doesn't hurt, keep writing. You know? <laughs> but his hand muscles were not strengthened. So I, I, I just feel like it's the awareness piece and it's bridging the gap with the pediatricians, with the educators, with the parents, with the legislators, letting everyone know why we do what we do and why it's important and why sensory is important. Because in preschool, right, you trace in sand. And in Montessori school, you trace in sand. But then when you get into a regular classroom, you're supposed to hold a pen or pencil correctly. But why is that? And how does that relate to the frontal lobe of the brain? Um, and so the more, I think the more exposure, uh, one thing that decoding dyslexia has done a great job of, and just like the whole SV48, I, it, the, the buzz is out there. And so people will say, oh, I've heard of that. Um, and that will bring their attention to it a little more. Yeah. Yesterday, I went to legislators offices to drop off packets of information um, to the 42 legislators who are on the House Education and Senate Education Committee um, committees. And it was just a little packet with um, Nancy Young's ladder of reading information about the num the current numbers of struggling readers in the state, the red flag checklist, um, a little bit about the 2019 NAEP scores, what's going on with the pilot, that sort of thing. Um, and one of the, uh, and this always happens when, when I talk about dyslexia is I always find somebody who's got some shred of misinformation about dyslexia. And, um, I might be the world's most boring person to talk to at a cocktail party because I will sit there and tell you everything you need to know in 30 seconds about dyslexia because um, the myth busting is a constant. So it, it's it's very it's very um, there, there's a lot there's a lot that we can do as parents to talk to our communities engage our school board members, engage our uh, community leaders. Um, one of our great parent advocates from South Georgia, uh, Meredith Kennedy, who I'm not sure is on the call right now, but is planning to join us at some point today. Um, she had ha lived in the district where representative chairman um, Bill Werkheiser is. Well, Werkheiser is the chairman of the labor uh, committee in the house. And um, one of the things that we can always tie our, our issues back to and literacy in general is that employers need employees who are highly literate, who are able to take the information that they're being given in the workplace and apply it to the jobs that they're doing. And that is especially true in technical areas. 
that even though there are computers, there is a lot that needs to be done related to computing that is still in the written form um, in the terms of service manuals in, you know, it, it just, it filters down to every area of life. Literacy is life and literacy is a civil right. And, and these are things that everybody needs to know. Um, before we jump over to the live stream of the Senate floor, which um, feel free to go get a cup of coffee because there's no telling what, what, how that's going to transpire in the next couple of minutes. But I just wanted to leave you with um, a book recommendation that I read over the summer. Um, Mary Ann, not Mary Ann Young, Mary Ann Wolf. Um, is a researcher who uh, was at Tufts and is now at UCLA. And in the spring of 2020, she released a book called Reader Come Home. And it talked about that very important um, dichotomy that has started to crop up where we need to be digitally literate, but we also need to be book literate. And both she and um, Mark Seidenberg who wrote Language at the Speed of Sight, talk about the explosion of words that are, we are faced with more words than we used to be more than ever. And so reading is not going to, the, the skill of reading is not recessing, it is coming forward because we have a fundamental need to connect. And the more we're connecting, the more we need to be able to read to make those connections with work, with people, with our leadership in the world, um, everything. Um, so I will leave you with those thoughts. And Hillary, if we can jump over now to the, uh, if you can screen share us to the uh, Senate floor. That would be awesome. Ah, I do have the link. So let me let me screen share my way. Let's see, let me minimize. I'm gonna turn off my video so you don't see my sticking, see, see me sticking my tongue out uh, Michael, Michael Jordan style like I do. Hold on just a second. 